Thank you, Professor Bernard Tan, for joining us today. Uh, let's start off with what made you decide to be a composer. Well, it's hard to say when I actually decided I was going to write music. Of course, music has always been very important to me. Like many people, I took piano lessons and all that sort of thing. And uh, I do remember that when I was young, when I listened to music, including classical music, especially classical music, I would sort of try to take the music and make up uh, how it would go uh, in, 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 in my own imagination. And you know, for many years I thought that everyone did the same thing. Then I realized later on that this was not that common. And uh, in terms of actual composition, I really started very late. I started in my late twenties, really, uh, and really started uh, when, when I was choir conductor of my church choir and I decided to try my hand at choral writing and I wrote one or two pieces for the choir and I got them to sing those pieces because I told I, I didn't want to tell them that they were written by me because they would sort of laugh at me so I told them that I found the pieces in the back of the cupboard so <laughs> and that's how I started okay it's uh, I mean most people know that my style of writing is very accessible it's very tonal uh, do I make it deliberately accessible and tonal? Well, tonality is important to me, certainly. Um, when I first started writing, I think most of the stuff I wrote was a bit more aggressive and a bit more difficult than what I'm doing today. Um, I think the key work I would uh, quote in respect is the first poem I did of Lee Su Ping's My Country and My People, which is a very famous poem. And I wrote it for piano and choir. It's a long work, about six to eight minutes. And uh, if you listen to that work, it's very different from what I'm writing today. I wrote it for the Singapore University Medical Singers. And uh, I think all my friends and colleagues uh, told me what on earth am I trying to do, what am I saying. And after that, I thought, you know, I better write things which uh, they can understand a bit more, you know. So I guess uh, that's when my approach to composition changed a little. In some of my work, uh, there is a tendency towards using things like a lot of um, parallel fifths, third, you know, uh, one, three, five chords in parallel, and that some people think that's a characteristic. Another one which I think is probably true is that in a lot of the pieces, particularly in the last few years, there is a uh, major minor ambiguity in, 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 in the music, you know. The music is very tonal, very accessible, but um, I think because of this major minor ambiguity, I think the music is a, I don't know whether it is disturbing or whether it is uh, unstable or whatever it is, and uh, it also could influence the way I modulate and the way I change, change uh, key and all that sort of thing. It's still extremely tonal, but but even my wife says that she knows that's my uh, my piece. Anyway, I, I, she she's saying I'm always writing the same piece of music. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, like all composers, melodies come to you, and of course you try to capture it in writing, lah. You know, but inspiration is important in the sense that something that strikes you, you know, you you got to capture it. But like m most composers. It's a hard, for, for me, you know, the, the composers for whom writing is easy, the composers for whom writing is difficult. I'm, I'm, I'm the sort of composer for whom writing is difficult to the point of being painful sometimes. So the best kind of inspiration is that someone commissions you and you've got a date. <laughs> then when the date approaches and the performance is coming up and you've got to rehearse your piece, desperation will strike. <laughs> you know, what I always say is that... Um, People always say that creativity is 99%, uh, uh, what is it, 1% uh, inspiration, 99% pers uh, perspiration. perspiration. Yeah. I actually, I modify that. I say it's like maybe 1% inspiration, uh, maybe 29% perspiration, and 70% desperation. <laughs> Which is true for a lot of people because when you have the deadline coming up, yeah. You 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 you've got no choice. You just have to sit down and put notes on paper. Yeah. And, and quite often, uh, what is being performed is the first thing that comes came into my head. I and see. Some, and and thank goodness, 
a lot of times it, it's okay lah. But um, who knows whether it's the first thing that came to my head or whether it was germinating all the time. It's a very for me, it's a very mysterious process, so I don't question it. Giving advice to young composers, okay, you, you mentioned undergraduate. That means students who, who take a composition major and have to pass an examination. Fortunately or unfortunately, it's like mathematics. You've got to pass counterpoint and harmony and all that sort of thing. You, got, you have to establish your, your credentials. You have to show that you're technically competent, you know. That's why, in a sense, uh, music theory is a bit like mathematics. You do exercises. Uh, that there's supposed to be a better solution and that sort of thing. Uh, when you write in the real world, it doesn't work like that. You cannot think of the technique first and then what I'm going to say later. It works the other way around. You think about what you're going to say, who you're going to say it to, and then you write it and then the technique should sort itself out. For example, to give you a very simple example, uh, you don't say, I'm going to write a book about parallel octaves or parallel fifths. <laughs> you know, don't worry about that because even Bach has parallel, J.S. Bach has parallel films, you know. So what you do is you write the, the music and after that you check whether your voice voice leading is okay and that sort of thing. So for, for young composers, I would, I would say, when the, okay, if you're writing for your professor, you write differently, you know. He, he wants you to do a technique. In fact, if you're writing for, even you, if you're writing for uh, DMA, Doctor Musical Arts, you write differently, you know, for example, yeah. I always remember uh, listening to Kelly Tang's piano concerto, which I had given to Lantry and then eventually Lantry played it, you know. When all of us heard it, uh, it did sound like Kelly Tang. It, it's a very, it's quite a dense, uh, difficult work. It didn't sound like him at all. So when I, after the performance, I asked Kelly, hey, that's not really like you, why you write like that? So, oh, that is my DMA exercise, so I have to write like that, you know. So it, it does say something, it was very good, competent work, of course, but it wasn't typical of him, actually, uh, because Kelly is a very skilled, very talented, very accessible composer, actually. So, uh, going back to advice to, to undergraduate composers, break out of your technical exercises, think about who you're writing for. Actually, when you think about who you're writing for, it becomes much easier. And also, for example, if you're writing for a particular performer, like in, in all of my uh, concertos, I'm writing for particular people, it also becomes easier to focus because if I'm writing for Tochi Chi Hang, I can imagine her playing it. I can imagine her personally. I know her so well. So the, the music seems to fall into place more easily like that. Oh, one other simple piece of advice I always give young composers in that is I mentioned voice leading, which is something that people never care about, but I, I think it's important. And that is make sure you know how to write good four-part harmony, SATV. That's the basis of everything. Because if you look at G.S. Park, even all his instrumental works are basically SATV. You know, they're, they're basically four-part harmony. Once you can do that well, you can do anything. But this is from myself. Uh, these are, I'm, I'm basically a conservative composer. I do believe that good four-part harmony and voice leading should be the basis of a, compos a composer's technique. The life of a professional composer is really difficult. That's why most of us are not doing it full-time. Uh, in fact, many composers actually don't, except for a very small minority, don't like, do it full-time. I mean, John Williams and uh, you know, Chen Yi and all that, uh, people of that caliber. Uh, so you have to find ways to, to, to get uh, works commissioned <coughs> and to find ways to get your, most important, get your work performed, whether it's commissioned or not. If it's commissioned, you get one performance, but you want a second performance. So one of the things I have always advised uh, young composers, to get a piece performed as a piece of music is difficult. But work together with dance and theatre people. That's and of course, if you have a chance to write for TV or film, grab it. These are good things to do because these are things that, uh, that, that A, give you a wider listenership, B, may give you some income, especially to TV and films, and C, uh, give you practice in writing to, I'm not saying writing to order, but it gives you a certain discipline, you know. In TV and film, you go write 32 seconds of something romantic, followed by 15 seconds of something dramatic. No, that doesn't sound like ideal composition. But yeah. <laughs> in, in actual fact, if you can do that sort of thing, it does discipline you to some extent, you know. But of course, as a composer, now and then you want to be able to write something that has no constraints. 
But working with uh, theatre, dance, TV and film, I think it's a, it's a good exercise. It's a good approach to get your music performed for a wider audience.